The scripture for today is in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 15 and 21 to 39. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus, son of, N of Nath Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly, come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who were ill and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak, because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place, where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Let us pray for Nick as he comes up to preach to us. Lord, we thank you that, yeah, for what Nick is about to say to us, and we ask that you would bless him and speak through him, and we ask that you would open up our hearts so that we can receive what you want to say to us. Amen. Thanks, Saskia. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you here. Well done. You made it through the uh, border control and made it into the promised land. We're going to start a bit differently today. I'm going to um, start by reading you a story. I hope you bear with me for that. It was the end of a long day of ministry, and I was exhausted. I had just completed a teaching conference in Chicago and was flying off to another speaking engagement in New York. I was looking forward to the plane ride as a chance to relax for a few hours before plunging back into teaching. But it was not to be the quiet, uneventful trip I had hoped for. Shortly after takeoff, I pushed back the reclining seat and readjusted the seatbelt, preparing to relax. My eyes wandered around the cabin, not looking at anything in particular. Seated across the aisle from me was a middle-aged man, a businessman to judge from his appearance, nothing unusual or noteworthy about him. But in the split second my eyes happened to be cast in his direction, I saw something that startled me. Written across his face in very clear and distinct letters, I thought I saw the word adultery. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, and looked again. It was still there, adultery. I was seeing it not with natural eyes, but in my mind's eye. No one else on the plane, I'm sure, saw it. 
It was the Spirit of God communicating to me. The fact that it was a spiritual reality made it no less real. By now, the man had become aware that I was looking at him, gaping at him, actually, um, would be a more accurate description. What do you want? He snapped as he spoke. A woman's name came to my mind. This was more familiar to me. I'd become accustomed to the Holy Spirit bringing things to my awareness through these kinds of promptings. Somewhat nervously, I leaned across the aisle and asked, does the name Jane mean anything to you? His face turned ashen. We've got to talk, he stammered. The plane we were on was a jumbo jet, the kind with a small upstairs cocktail lounge. As I followed him up the stairs to the lounge, I sensed the spirit speaking to me yet again. Tell him, if he doesn't turn from his adultery, I'm going to take him. Terrific. <clears throat> All I had wanted was a nice, peaceful plane ride to New York. Now here I was, sitting in an airplane, cocktail lounge, with a man I'd never seen before, whose name I didn't even know, about to tell him God was going to take his life if he didn't stop his, his affair with some woman. We sat down in strained silence. He looked at me suspiciously for a moment and asked, who told you that name? God told me. He almost shouted the question. He was, God told you? He almost shouted the question. He was so shocked by what I'd said. Yes, I answered, taking a deep breath. He, he also told me to tell you that unless you turn from the adulterous relationship, he's going to take your life. I braced myself for what I was sure would be an angry, defensive reaction. But to my relief, the instant I spoke to him, his defensiveness crumbled. His heart melted. In a choked and desperate voice, he said, what should I do? At last, I was back on familiar ground. I explained to him it meant what it meant to repent and trust Christ and invited him to pray with me. With hands folded and head bowed, I began to lead him in a quiet prayer. Oh God, that was as far as I got. The conviction of sin that had built up inside him seemed virtually to explode. Bursting into tears, he cried, Oh God, I'm so sorry, and launched into the most heart-rending repentance I had ever heard. It was impossible in such cramped quarters to keep hidden what was happening. Before long, everyone in the cocktail lounge was intimately acquainted with this man's past sinfulness and his present contrition. Even the stewardesses were weeping right along with him. When he finished praying and regained his composure, we talked for a while about what had happened to him. The reason I was so upset when you mentioned that name to me, he explained, was that my wife was sitting in the seat right next to me. I don't want her to hear. I knew he wasn't going to like what I was going to say next. You're going to have to tell her. I am? He responded weakly. When? Better do it right now, I said gently. The prospect of confessing to his wife was understandably somewhat intimidating, but he could see that there was no other way. So again, I followed him down the stairs and back to our seats. I could hear the conversation over the noise of the plane. Couldn't hear it over the noise of the plane, but I could see his wife's stunned reaction, not only to his confession of infidelity, but also to his account of how the stranger sitting across the aisle had been sent by God to warn him of the consequences of sin. Eyes wide with amazement and probably terror, she stared first at her husband and then at me and then back at her husband and then back at me as the amazing story unfolded. In the end, the man led his wife to accept Christ right there on the airplane. There was little time to talk when we got off the plane in New York. They didn't own a Bible, so I gave them mine and we went our separate ways. What do you make of that story? What's your reaction? Um, I think there may be different reactions around the room here. I'm not going to ask you, but I'm going to suggest some reactions. Some people might think, well, I don't believe that. That that's, couldn't have happened. I don't believe that. Or some others might say, hmm, that was really encouraging. Uh, others may say, well, that guy, he must be an incredible Christian to you know, hear from God like that. Wow. Or some of you might be thinking, I'd love to have something like that happen to me. Whatever your reaction this week, we're beginning 
um, three sessions on the topic of wonders. Um, remember, we've been thinking about loving the Lord uh, our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, and how that often leads to those various things, beginning with double, W, the four Ws. We've been thinking about worship for three weeks. We're just going to start thinking about wonders for three weeks, and we're going to think about word and works later on. Um, you know, when we hear of Jesus preaching the gospel, it's never just with words. It's always with a demonstration of power uh, and with wo working wonders. Mark's gospel, uh, which we heard a little bit from, is a wonderful example uh, of those sorts of miracles and wonders that uh, Jesus did. And, you know, Mark, if you've read Mark's gospel, and I expect most of you had, it's a really racy book, isn't it? It doesn't sort of slouch over all the details. It just goes from one thing to the next, uh, you know, one after the next. It's immediately this and immediately that, and it keeps moving so quickly. And um, I want to just uh, remind you of some of the things we heard in that chapter. Jesus is baptized. He's baptized by John the Baptist. Um, the Holy Spirit comes upon him uh, in a visible form, and we know that uh, the voice of God speaks out uh, to him. Um, immediately, it says that the, the Holy Spirit pushes him into the desert where he's tempted. Uh, we know from other places that he has a very tough time, uh, but he overcomes Satan. And in Luke, it tells us that when he comes back from the desert, he comes back in the power of the Spirit. Carrying on with Mark. Mark says, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. He doesn't actually go into the details of what the good news is. He's in such a rush to get on with the next thing he's saying. But what he does record is that Jesus says that the kingdom of God is near. It's at hand. And what Jesus is saying is that the planet, this planet, which has been under the power and the rule of the prince of the world, who gained authority when Adam, Adam and Eve you know, took from that tree and no longer were there to rule, uh, but Satan gained that place of being prince of this earth, of this world. Uh, Jesus is saying now, he's coming. And this is the invasion of the kingdom of God into that kingdom that Satan has established. It's like, it's a bit like he's announcing D-Day, you know, in the Second World War, D-Day, the day when the invasion began. It's, it's going to happen from now. And he says, repent, turn away from your sin and believe the good news. But as I say, he doesn't actually tell us what the good news is, uh, Mark. He doesn't go into that. Again, we, we're, look, we're left to Luke to, to find out what that good news is. And in Luke chapter 4, and verse 18, uh, Luke records that Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth, where he grew up, and um, he asks for the scroll of Isaiah, and then he reads from that scroll, and it, he reads this, the spirit of the Lord is on me, because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he sits down, he says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled. And the good news, part of it is his declaration that the kingdom of God has come. But part of it is actually physically giving freedom, as it turns out, freedom to people who needed to be set free. It's not the political freedom, but it is, you know, freedom from people who are held in bondage in all sorts of ways. It's giving sight, literally and spiritually, to those who are blind. It's bringing blessing to people so that their lives are totally transformed. Then Mark rushes on, and we find Jesus uh, in Capernaum. And his preaching, as we heard read to us, uh, Mark says is with authority. So what happens? He's already in, in, with authority, he, he records. 
just it's so different from the way the scribes and the Pharisees teach. It's they, they've got a book learning. Jesus seems to really know what he's talking about. It comes with heart authority that he speaks. And what happens? A demonized man pops up and starts shouting. There's an immediate confrontation with the prince of this world because he knows that Jesus has come to plunder his kingdom. Jesus has come not just with words, but with power. And it's a wonder, and the demon is silenced, and the man is set free. He's delivered. And then we read that uh, he goes to Simon's house. Um, he's, he <coughs> heals Simon's mum. And then, you know, word gets around when you start doing amazing works like that, amazing wonders like healing the sick and delivering people who are demonized. And word gets around, and so before you know it, there's a whole load of people at the door wanting healing and deliverance, and that's what they get. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, Jesus needs some time. You know, it's very exhausting work doing all those things. And so the next thing we hear, early in the morning, he goes off on his own to a dark place, to a, a lonely place, and spends some time with God. And Peter and his friends come looking for him. Lord, everybody's looking for you. Um, and Jesus says, I have come to do these things. I've come, I've got to go to other places to do just what we've what I've just been doing. I can't stay here. There's many other places that I've got to go and do just the same. And so from here on in Mark, we just see so many uh, miracles that Jesus does, so many wonders that he's, he does alongside his preaching. And I guess in Mark particularly, we see a lot of those sorts of things almost more than the, the long sessions of teaching that he gives elsewhere. It's, as, it's the demonstration of the message uh, the message and the demonstration of what he's actually saying go hand in hand. Now, you might be thinking, this is all very interesting, but that was Jesus. What has that got to do with me? Um, I could never see a wonderful thing like that happen. I could never do that. I could never do what that guy did on the plane. I'm going to ask you some questions. This is when you can actually interact and, and let me have your responses, okay? Um, I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but if you're happy, you can put up a hand when I ask you the questions. Now, I think these are pretty easy questions for most of you. Have any, has anyone here been born again of the Spirit of God? If you have, doesn't matter if you haven't, that's fine. But if you have, just put your hand up. Yeah, you're absolutely sure. Absolutely sure you have got the Spirit of God living in you. That is a wonderful thing, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing. Um, that is a real wonder, an amazing wonder that God's Spirit, the God who created everything, would actually come and dwell in your heart and mine. Okay, um, here's another one. Have any of you ever had an answer to prayer? Not, you know, one that you're really sure was, yeah, you prayed and this thing happened. Yeah, a lot of people. Isn't that great? Another wonderful thing, another wonder that it actually happened that God would actually hear your prayer, the God of the universe would hear your prayer and mine. Isn't that amazing? That is incredible. Okay, two more. Has anyone ever felt that God spoke to them? Yeah, quite a lot of people. That they, he actually spoke something to you, that you think about it and you think, well, yep, he spoke to me and so I'm going to act on it and it changed my life. That's also an amazing wonder that God would be able to speak into our hearts and speak to us so we could hear and so it would change us. Lastly, has anyone prayed for healing for someone and seen it happen? Yeah, lots of people. That's amazing too, isn't it? So now we know that God's still alive. He's still working in our hearts. He's still using us. He's still speaking to us, and he's still doing wonderful things. So these things are relevant to us because he's still doing stuff. Um, Jesus demonstrates his method for bringing the good news of the kingdom to the world through word, but also through doing wonderful things like the things we've just been saying he does for us. 
And I think that's a model for us, really. You see, soon after this, we find that Jesus prepares the apostles um, and his followers for doing the work in the same sort of way. In Luke chapter 10, chapter 9, sorry, he sends out the 12 apostles. And uh, he tell, it's like the first mission. They're going to go and have a go on their own. Uh, and he sa- it says, when Jesus co- had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them to, out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal those who were ill. In other words, just the same as he did. He, they proclaimed the kingdom, they drove out demons, they healed the sick. Verse 6 says, so they went out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Now, you might say, well, yeah, but that was the 12 apostles. We're not apostles. We're not 12 apostles. The next chapter gives us a bit of an answer to that because chapter 10, it says the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. So it wasn't just the 12 apostles. There were all these other people that he sent as well. And he told them, heal those there who are ill and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. A bit later in the passage in chapter 10, verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It's as though, you know, this was tearing down the kingdom of darkness and bringing the kingdom of God. Um, And again, you might say, well, they were probably, you know, they'd been following the Lord for a few years, maybe, and um, maybe they're quite mature followers. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be super mature to see God do a wonder. Um, We went to China uh, a number of times, but uh, I think the last time we went, um, believe it or not, they said, would we prepare, the church we went to, would we prepare some people Uh, young people to do a street outreach in China. We thought, "Um, are you sure? (laughs) You want to do a street outreach in China? It was a few years ago um, when you could still move a bit more freely. But yes, they did want us to prepare them for a street outreach. Okay, so we went ready to prepare them for a street outreach and we did our teaching and um, they went off and did their mission and included doing door to door. There were a couple of guys who went to the door of one house they knocked on the door, and they, the person who answered it was a lady. These guys were about 19, 20 years old. She was an older lady. She couldn't speak. She'd been dumb since she was born. And they thought, oh, sorry, we, we come. We'd better go to the next house. We'll leave this one. Then they thought, well, at least we could pray for her. So they prayed for her, and she spoke. They weren't old Christians, they weren't very mature Christians, but they trusted what Jesus said. They prayed, and he did a wonderful thing. So he prepared the apostles, he prepared the other disciples, he prepared the church to do such things. In John's Gospel, we read about Jesus preparing the disciples for when he's going to leave. And in chapter 14, um, he makes some amazing promises to them. He says, truly, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Because he's going to the Father, he's going to send the advocate, the comforter, the helper, the one who's going to come and be with them, alongside them, inside them. And we know very well the verse in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus says to Uh, his followers, his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This power will enable you to do that. It will equip you to do this sort of mission that I've been doing in word and in deed. The word is dunamis. It's the dynamite It's the same Greek word, same root Greek word that is used for miracles. 
200, no, 137 times in the AV, um, in the King James Version. And it just means works of power. It works of power or miracles. The proclamation to the world is to be by word and wonders. And so what do we find? The day of Pentecost comes, Holy Spirit falls on the church and wonderful things happen. And then the next story in the next chapter, chapter 3, Peter and John uh, go to the temple. And, you know, they see this chap, they've seen him many times. He's been begging there for years and years. He's lame. He needs help. He wants money. Peter says, I don't have any money. But what I have, look at me, what I have is this. And he says, in the name of Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And the man gets up and walks. And it says that they were filled, the people around were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened. Verse 11, while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, and so the wonder that he'd performed in the name of Jesus gave him an audience and he then proclaimed the gospel, and many came to faith. And so Peter and John are following the example that Jesus gave of speaking and also performing wonders. And there are many other scriptures you can see as you read through the Acts of the Apostles where those two things go together, where there's a wonder and there's a word, there's an opportunity to speak the word. Um, just one I'm going to choose, which is in Acts chapter 13. I think it's going to come up, um, and we're going to just read this. This is when um, Paul and Barnabas had gone to Cyprus. So they just started their missionary work in chapter 13 of Acts. And uh, they were when they got to Cyprus, there they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. So it sounds as though they gave him the word of God at that point. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now, the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, the mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, uh, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And when the proconsul saw what happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. He'd heard the teaching. He got the intellectual understanding, perhaps. But this was something more that gave such power to that message because he could see that this was a God who actually did things, who actually uh, performed wonders. Here's the thing. John 20, 21 says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And uh, obviously he was talking to a small group when he said that after the resurrection. But I believe it was meant for us. He's sending us in the same way, even down to today, all these thousands, hundreds of years later after he said that. So that I'm going to just ask these questions. How can I access this type of uh, ministry, if you like? How can I access these wonders? How do I start just for very simple things? Because this may seem overwhelming to you may seem very far removed from you. The first thing is this, and it's foundational, really. It's get your life rightly focused. Get your life, life rightly focused. Get the foundation right. So Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, and these other things that you need will follow. But seek first the kingdom of God, and if you do that, other things get into place. But that's such a foundation. 
you've got to get that foundation there first. So for me personally, I was a Christian for five years, um, and I would have said I was a Christian, but I was fairly, probably lukewarm would be an accurate description. I don't think I wanted Jesus as my savior. I liked the idea of Jesus. I was interested in knowing more about him, but I don't think I'd fully appreciated that actually he needed to be Lord, King over everything in my life. And it was only when I allowed him to be King that everything else seemed to make sense and it started to click and the promises seemed to be real and the Bible came alive. Those things happened as I realized that actually it was no good having one foot in one camp, uh, one foot in the world, living a bit like the world does and another camp, perhaps on Sundays, being uh, like a Christian. I had to be wholehearted. When I got that sorted out, that made a foundational difference to my life. And I believe that's how God wants. That's a foundation. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is this, listen to God. Why? Because Jesus said that he only does what he sees the Father doing. Uh, in John chapter 5, verses 19, 20, you can read it for yourself. Uh, but he, he does, he did what he saw his Father in heaven doing. Those, that's why he had such authority because he did it with the authority of the Father. And I know you, the thoughts that are going through your head. You're thinking, well, I can't hear God like that. Um, actually, if you're a Christian, you can hear God. You have already heard God, because otherwise you wouldn't be a Christian. You know, you've heard him. You might not have heard an audible voice. I've not heard an audible voice. But you've heard him in your heart, speaking to you, convicting you, revealing that you needed to get right. And so you can hear him. John chapter 10, my sheep know my voice. They hear my voice and they know the voice of the good shepherd. So we can hear God. And I'd suggest that you start, if you want to do this, you start with something really small. When you have your time with God, just say, to, and maybe you're praying for your family, your friends, your colleagues, whoever you pray for, uh, just say, Lord, what would you like to say to me for that person. Maybe he will give you a scripture. Maybe he'll, something will be, you know, as though it's very sharp in your reading that day. That will be something he's answering you with and that you can then share with that person. You can just drop them a, uh, a message or whatever and say, oh, I was just praying for you today and I felt I should share this verse. That's how the Lord can speak so simply to all of us. It may be that he'll give you something else for that person. Maybe, you know, maybe a picture of something that you can share. Maybe uh, some other way in which you feel you can share the love of God with that person. But start very simply and see where it goes and do it regularly. And you'll begin to hear what he's saying, what he's calling you to do. We, um, many years ago, uh, had um, lived in a very beautiful little place in England. Um, and it was a village. It was an unusual village because uh, it had about 3,000 people living in it. But 750 of those people were students because it had part of London University's uh, College of Agriculture was in this place. It was 65 miles away from London, but it had part of London University in it. And uh, so we we had not intended to go there for that reason. We'd gone there to live for work reasons and other reasons, but we realized that actually God had put us there for a reason. Here we were with all these in, well, British students, about 600 British students, who didn't really have a, uh, a live place of worship to go to, and uh, we were longing to share uh, the love of God with them. And we had about 150 people from all sorts of countries, many of which you couldn't go to as a missionary. And we thought, oh, wow, we could talk to them, be friends with them as well, because they were very lonely. They thought they'd come to London, they'd come to the country, where it was miles from anywhere. And so uh, we had a lot of parties to bring, get to know them and uh, be friends with them. 
And as we uh, realized that actually God was, had put us there for a purpose, um, we started to pray. And there was, um, if you've ever been to England and you've been to an English village, you will know that quite often there's a rather quaint little tea shop in the village. Um, you know, probably ye olde English sheep, um, tea shop, uh, shoppy, spelt in a funny way. Uh, and, there are, and there were two of those in this village. One was closed. The other one was almost opposite the college. And we thought, well, Lord, it would be great to have a shop where we could have coffee and lunches and serve some food and um, people could come in and we could gently help them find you. Uh, and we began to pray and we thought, Lord, if this is going to happen, we need three things. First of all, we need a shop, one of the shops to come on the market so we could, we could actually get hold of it. Uh, secondly, we need some money because we haven't got any money. And thirdly, we really need to hear the word of the Lord so we know that you are in this. And um, I think the first thing that came up was that the shop that was right opposite the college went up for sale. Ooh, that's interesting. That's been interesting timing. Maybe that's the Lord answering our prayer. Maybe we should look a bit further. And so we still needed some money. I was working as a lawyer in the nearby town, and uh, I suddenly got a very big pay rise. And uh, it wasn't the amount that we'd been thinking that we needed, but it was some of the amount. And I actually didn't put the two things together at all until my uncle, uh, my old uncle, wrote to us out of the blue and he said, I've been thinking that I would leave you this money when I die, but now I thought I'd give it to you now. And at, when we added that money to the money of my rise, it was the actual amount that we had been thinking we needed as a confirmation to know this was really from the Lord. So we thought, okay, that's two out of three. And then we got someone sent us the word. And you know that word in Malachi where it says, you know, if you bring all your tithes into the storehouse, then uh, I will pour out a blessing from heaven so great that you can't contain it. So we thought, yep, that's it, that's it. We're going to go for this. And we went for it. And we bought the shop and um, started the ministry there and ran that for a number of years. And we would have things by the side of the table and people could come in and they could choose whether they wanted to ask us about why we were there. But many people did, and uh, many people found Christ in that place at evangelistic dinners in the evening and stuff. So um, I, it just started because we wanted to listen to what he was saying, and we wanted to find a way in which we could serve him. Now, that is wonderful, so far as I'm concerned, because it happened to me. But I believe God has an adventure for you as well. And if you start by saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? What wonderful thing are you going to do through me? And start by asking him. The third thing uh, that you can do to start is to earnestly desire. Now you might think, well, I don't really earnestly desire the Lord or, uh, you know, something from him or to do these wonderful things. You could ask him to make you want to desire that. But uh, I believe that earnestly desiring is important. You know, in... Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, it says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Uh, and I, it's a bit like that. You, you get these wonders when you earnestly desire to see them. If you're not bothered, you won't get them, probably. Uh, God may choose to do it, but you know, normally when you actually seek God for things, they come. And um, there was a time later on that we um, were in a different place, but again, involved with a lot of students. And um, we had one student, we were earnestly seeking healing at the time. We wanted to be to see people healed. That's what we were earnestly seeking. And uh, one day, a girl in our group, a uh, university girl, she said, um, I've broken my arm, they've put me in a plaster, um, and it's hurting quite a lot. And we said, okay, well, come on Sunday, Sunday night, and we'll pray for you. And so she came to our meeting. It was in our home. We had about, I don't know, at that time, maybe 70 students in the house at that moment. And uh, she, uh, we said, we're going to pray for Caroline right at the beginning tonight. 
um, and pray that her arm, which is in this cast, would be healed, that she would be healed of the pain that she has. Probably that was the extent of our faith. I'm not quite sure what exactly we prayed. Um, so we prayed and we went on with worship. I was leading worship on the guitars. Never seen that before. Uh, and um, unusually in the middle of the worship, she said, excuse me, Nick, um, my arm feels I'm getting all this heat going up and down my arm. I think I've been healed. And we thought, mm, it's in a cast. How do you know? You know, how can we tell? Anyway, she was fairly confident about this. And the next day, she went to the medical facility at the university and said, I, I think my arm is healed. And they're sort of looking at the plaster cast, thinking, well, I'm afraid it's staying on for six weeks, you know. Um, and so she went to the hospital and she said, uh, I think I'm healed. Uh, um, would you take the plaster off, please? And they said, well, the nurse was a Christian, and she said, I believe in healing, but not of broken bones. Uh, the doctor came in, and uh, the doctor looked at it, and he said, oh, it's not been set properly. We'll take the cast off, because we'll reset it and put the cast back on, but put it on properly. So they took the cast off, and you can tell what's going to happen, can't you? The arm, the broken arm, was healed. There was no broken bone. That was amazing. The doctors and the nurses were absolutely, you know, and so were many of the students, absolutely mind blown. These sorts of things, they reach people which, where, you know, you can tell them, you could rationalize the word, you could tell them all about why Christ is the truth. And they may just walk away. But you show them a broken arm that's healed, that has a big impact. Uh, and so wonders are really important, and they still happen. The last thing is this, um, how to get started, share the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus did this as he was proclaiming the kingdom. He was taking back the enemy's territory. The, the apostles were taking back the enemy's territory as uh, they proclaimed the word and did the wonders. And, you know, that's where we're likely to see great things happen as we seek to extend the kingdom. This is not about us having, you know, a cozy Christian club where, you know, we can get each other completely healed up and well and we're all very happy. We want to see other people come to faith in Christ and the kingdom of God extend. Um, and I just want to tell you this last story. Um, we did uh, an outreach with some of these students. Um, this was the last one we did with them. And we went to a place called Glastonbury. Has anybody heard of Glastonbury? Well, apart from the British people. <laughs> Glastonbury is in the southwest of England. It has a big uh, rock pop festival every year. It has done since the 60s. And everybody you've ever heard of in that in you know popular music has performed there probably uh and as a result of that it's glastonbury the town has become very sort of weird and uh, everything every new age um type of thing that could possibly exist goes on there and it's really weird and anyway we were invited by the pastor there to go and take a mission and we said okay what we'd really love to do is to have something where people would like to come we tried various ideas, and he said, oh, no, people in Glastonbury don't do that. Oh, no, they don't do that either. And Grace really felt that she'd heard from the Lord, and she said, I know exactly what they will do. They'll come to a healing meeting. And uh, so we suggested this to the pastor. Oh, yeah, healing, they'll come for that, because uh, they're all into healing with crystals and all the rest of it. And so we put posters all around the town saying, we're going to have a meeting uh, for healing in Jesus' name alone. A bit provocative. Uh, and um, so the evening came, we're praying, Lord, <laughs> you really need to turn up for us because we're putting ourselves right out on a limb here. Uh, and um, they came, lots of people came, uh, lots of inquirers, people who didn't know the Lord but you know, believed in other sorts of healing. Um, but I just want to tell you about one person who came. Um, he was somebody who had cerebral palsy. He was walking past the church 
while we were doing this service, and he saw the sign um, for healing. And he, he was with a carer who was looking after him. He, he managed to, and he was also unable to speak, sorry, unable to hear, he was, he was deaf. Uh, and he managed to tell his hearer that he wanted to go in the meeting. So they went into the meeting, and at the end of the meeting, there was an opportunity for prayer. And our young guys were praying in a little side chapel for anyone who wanted prayer. And this guy came forward. And, you know, he's in physical difficulty. He can't hear. What are they going to pray? So they prayed, well, Lord, please come. Please bless him. And suddenly he starts doing this. And they turned to his carer, what is he doing? And uh, she said, it's the guitar. They can hear the guitar. He can hear the guitar. He's deaf. But he could start to hear. And I'm playing the guitar over here, as usual, uh, in the middle. And the guy comes over and stands in front of me. Um, you know, imagine I'm here playing the guitar for you. And this chap's standing here. And for the rest of my worship set, he's standing there listening to me and watching me play my guitar. He could hear. And this was so exciting for him because he could hear. Now, this is what, you know, you have to go out on a limb. You have to trust. But it was bit by bit. It wasn't all in one go. And... Yeah, he was stone deaf. He couldn't hear anything before. Yeah. But now he heard. So, yeah, we gave God praise for that. Um, and I believe as we seek to share the kingdom, um, he will do that for us too. So let's make sure our lives are rightly focused. Let's listen to God. Let's earnestly desire that we may also see these things. And let's share the kingdom. Can we pray? Father, we thank you so much that Jesus came in power. He came in humility, but he came with the anointing of the Spirit when his ministry started. And we're so grateful that you combined humility with a demonstration of your word being powerful and your actions releasing the captives, setting people free, bringing healing. Lord, we long for that again today. Help us, Lord, as we seek to take our own little steps of faith. Uh, may we see you lead us and use us for your sake. Amen.